Hello and welcome everyone to today's Visual Scholar webinar. My name is Katja Reuter. Today we will um, explore a fun topic that is uh, related to the dissemination of science. But as you might see, you know, it, it, it challenges some of us. Um, so we will explore the world of comics and we want to learn more about a method um, that you can actually use to explain your research in a sequence of pictorial or other images. So this is relevant because scientists these days are not only expected to develop highly specialized content to communicate with peers, as we all know, um, but we are also challenged to reach a broader audience. So we hope that with today's webinar, you will be able to describe a framework for translating a complex scientific publication into a broadly accessible comic format, and that you will be able to describe guidelines for developing such a, such a comic. So the conceptual foundation, scientifically relevant settings, characters, to really uh, be able to develop a storyboard. And uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers to you. We have uh, Dr. Jan Friesen. He is an eco-hydrologist at the Helmholtz Center of Environmental Research at the University of Leipzig in Germany, biologist and biotechnologist at a biotech, biotech company in Germany. And so, as always, please feel free to add any questions you may have to the chat on the right side of the webinar. And thank you for joining us today. So, Jan and Skander, the mic is all yours. Um, dear Katja, thanks for the opportunity to present our method within the SCS CTSI webinar series and welcome everybody. We are very glad to be here and we hope to give you an entertaining and informative lecture today. So as Katja already introduced, our topic today is in our case a very own and very personal approach how to develop a comic based on research. Jan and I, we are both uh, natural scientists from two very diverse disciplines, and we are both uh, very fascinated and excited about comics. We have started to collaborate in interdisciplinary projects to, um, already a couple of years ago, and um, over the years we have strengthened our focus, and maybe about a year and a half ago, we uh, realized that both that you, as huge comic fans, we might work on, on a comic topic together. So um, as every child, at least in Europe, we started to read Asterix comics or Lucky Luke and later went on to read classical superhero comics. Nowadays, we still read comics, but we switch to more demanding graphic novels with complexer stories. So just as an example, at the moment, I'm reading a graphic novel with thousands um, um, of images on hundreds of pages with only very, very few words, um, which is on the genesis of the earth and the evolution of life and the history of humans. However, uh, we um, realized some time ago that we would be really excited to, to produce a science comic um, by our own. And we were very, very lucky that we had the opportunity to apply for funding uh, at the Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, uh, in which we um, both are members. We are going to talk about all this um, a little bit in more detail um, over the next hour. However, um, we would like to um, start our presentation um, with a short quote, which actually is from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, um, to demonstrate how beautiful um, and at the, same, at the same time how complicated language can be. So um, this is an issue that probably all or at least most scientific disciplines share. And um, yeah, by uh, the same time, this might be also the reason for, the, for our webinar today to take about an hour. Um, so, however, Jan and I, we are no linguists, and today we are not talking about how to translate our science into old entish. But as already mentioned, we are trying to show you um, how science can be communicated uh, through comics. Um, to give you a brief overview about our lecture, I would like to draw your attention um, to this slide here. So I will start with a short introduction. I will talk a little bit about science communication and comics. Um, please keep in mind all the time that Jan and I were no professional science communicators, but natural scientists. 
And afterwards, Jan will go on and start to talk about our approach um, that we have developed um, yeah, to develop a comic that is exclusively based on a single publication. Uh, Jan will talk about our conceptual foundation, what we usually do to develop an appropriate setting. Um, he will introduce you um, in some examples to a background story and um, afterwards we are uh, talking about some typical features of characters uh, that can be used in, co in comics. Um, here stereotypes are key. Um, finally, we will talk uh, about the development of a detailed storyboard and some bottlenecks in communicating science to an artist um, who might be a layman. And we are going to close the session and give you some examples of outreach we have generated and feedback that we have received for the comics. So um, as a start, so science communication is really a current topic. Um, it's increasingly demanding for all scientists across all disciplines. Um, so we as scientists, we have to write commentaries we have to provide press releases or at least drafts of press releases. Um, Sometimes we have to give interviews or um, some of us even produce YouTube channels. And most often scientists are not, uh, no longer only uh, talking at scientific conferences, but also on panel discussions or on cultural events to broader and especially um, also to non-scientific audiences. However, <clears throat> Um, we all beca became very, very specialized over the years. So there are no uh, universal scholars nowadays anymore. Um, and um, if we want to explain our science, uh, we, um, we have to do this without creating the impression um, of a scientist sitting in her or his scientific ivory tower. And um, due to this immensely uh, increasing amount of scientific knowledge, um, it's, it's, it is becoming harder and harder to get information from outside um, of our own field. And science communication, of course, will simplify uh, the consumption of scientific content. For example, what I'm doing um, in my office every day is I, uh, I do screen headlines of press releases at, uh, at science information services in, uh, on the web um, to broaden my knowledge and to look behind my own scientific and, um, yeah, let's say, biological plate. Mm. There are also a lot of uh, new and very innovative formats out, uh, out there. Um, some of them I do like very, very much. We would just briefly introduce you to some of them. So, um, for example, um, um, a concept that might not be that novel, but um, uh, it is uh, provided, for example, by some of the huge publishers, is that if you have published a paper, you um, can produce audio slides. These are very short presentations that are given by you as the author uh, to summarize your own paper um, just as a kind of appetizer for your for your paper or um, I don't know if um, if you know the Journal of Visual Experiments um, this even goes one step further and provides complete short uh, movies dealing with a topic of a publication and these are often combined for example with interviews um, uh, with the researchers and um, one format that I really do like is um, maybe you uh, also know the Frontiers for Young Minds series um, in which articles are published that are written by a scientist, but to a very, very young audience. And the clue in this case is that these manuscripts are not only read, uh, read by kids, they are also reviewed by kids. And um, to, um, to submit papers there and to get feedback is, really, really exciting. Or, for example, as the last um, example to see in entertaining science slam on stage is also always a pleasure. Okay, but um, after the small excursion, uh, we come back to comics now. Um, comics are already regarded as um, art science um, since the early 1970s. Um, of course, uh, they might not be comparable to sculptures or arch architectures, but they become increasingly popular over the years. 
Um, one very, very famous comis, comic artist, uh, Will Eisner, he um, gave this definition of comics. So the arrangement of pictures or images and words to narrate a story or dramatize an idea. Um, he is uh, one of the, uh, of the um, greatest comic icons maybe and the inventor of comprehensive graphic novels. However, um, this definition is um, very, a very simple definition and uh, in a way it's so wide that it can uh, basically include all, work, uh, all works of art that use sequential images, for example, inc including Egyptian murals or Greek vases or uh, things like that. However, um, also classical comic strips of three to five images or longer um, stories such as classic superhero comics or even the very long comprehensive graphic novels um, can uh, also fit this definition. Um, I just want to mention um, um, here, I just recently read uh, his book for which the term graphic novel has been invented. It's called The Contract with God, which, and this is really a must read of comic and storytelling. 500 pages and really, really nice. Um, however, uh, today we would like to talk about uh, science comics and the production um, of, the, uh, of these derived from scientific um, publications. And therefore, uh, we would like uh, to quickly emphasize uh, the, um, the different content in comics and in classical science publications. So um, to write a paper that is entertaining, not only for the very close community that works on your own subject, but also to a broader audience is quite hard. Maybe it's even impossible um, uh, because for example, it often interferes with instructions to authors that precisely define how to write and structure um, your manuscript. Moreover, it's um, essential to, in, in natural sciences, um, at least to repeat experiments. Um, it's a must to describe every meticulous detail um, of a complex story. Um, and the language we are using or we, we have to use is usually very dry, maybe a bit boring and highly technical. Um, although, of course, differences in language might be dependent on scientific disciplines, of course. Um, at least in addition, um, we are allowed and we often use figures, but these figures are um, usually includes uh, a bunch of details and figure legends. And of course, most important for, for um, a paper, um, we are starting with a hypothesis that is um, discussed and evaluated um, until the end of the, of the conclusion. In contrast to this, um, comics are usually very short. And because they are so short, they need to be very, very clear. So if we think of scientific comics, the scientific part in a comic must be concise and it must be somehow embedded in an interesting and entertaining background story. So um, in some cases, Jan will show you later, uh, what we are doing here is um, that our background stories often become longer than the actual scientific part in the end. However, the hardest point for a scientist um, might be to choose or to pick the most important points because in the scientist view, of course, everything is somehow important. But since space is limited in comics, it is of tremendous importance to be resti restricted to the most interesting parts. Um, moreover, a huge challenge is a visualization. So how do I choose and design images that are mostly self-explanatory or that can be explained with very, very little text or even just in speech bubbles? Um, okay, so um, in the main part of our talk, we will give you um, our very personal perspective. And I would like to, sc to start by asking the question how uh, we did get into science comics um, so we had to think about communication all earlier, but not really in the beginning about science communication in general, but more on a 
kind of inter interdisciplinary uh, communications because um, we um, started somehow with um, with uh, our project when um, we were at a kind of meeting um, from the Young Academy of Sciences I mentioned earlier. And um, in this Academy of Sciences, there are uh, scientists from all different um, um, areas. So from the humanities, there are engineers and um, scientists from the life science uh, sciences. And we were uh, meeting for a workshop in the desert and at this time, um, we were brainstorming not about comics, but about different topics that were interesting for some of us at least. And being inspired by the uh, desertic environment and the environmental unfriendly, but energy demanding SUVs, for example, uh, which brought us uh, to the desert, you can see them on the pictures. Um, four of us came up with a topic on green energies and green technologies. So um, we were talking about halophytes, uh, which are plants that thrive in salty environments uh, without competing with crop uh, plants as, so as food sources. And to make a short story, uh, long story short, sorry, um, as you can see here on, on top, um, we were a soil scientist, then eco-hydrologist. By the way, this is Jan, my co-lecturer for today a plant biologist and myself, I am a biotechnologist and trained microbiologist. Um, so we were sitting there in the desert discussing a very current topic from four different perspectives and uh, we, uh, with four different backgrounds. And we very often got stuck because we did not understood each other and we often thought about now the help from a good science communicator would be really, really nice. Um, however, we managed to um, publish um, a very long review about, uh, which is about 50 pages um, on this topic, but we, um, um, we were often stumbling about sentences, for example, like this one. So typical scientific language, there it is written, uh, lignocellulose can be broken down by a number of glycosid hydrolases of prokaryotic or fungal origin. So to me, the sentence is very easy to understand and clear, but it was um, somehow hard for my colleagues. Of course, um, for the talk today, today I have chosen a, um, a sentence from my own discipline on purpose because I did not want to read something about evapotranspiration or different types of soils or whatever was, co uh, was covered in the, uh, in the paper as well. Okay, but the question is, what does the sentence mean? And um, we are able and might uh, trans uh, transform the sentence really into plain language and write a very, very simple uh, sentence. For example, like this, in principle, it means the same. Microbes can transform plants into sugar. And um, after having finished this project, so the publication of this um, long scientific art article, uh, we were thinking about an audience that can benefit from our experience. Moreover, we were brainstorming uh, again um, about a format that is attractive and that could be used um, to, um, to uh, explain our results in a more attractive way. And in the end, based on our personal taste, we have decided to go for comics. Um, and when we thought about a potential target group, we first thought, okay, in principle, our target group can be basically everyone who does not know what glycosid hydrolases or prokaryotes are, for example. But with a little research, we came across that we are going to start this project in a way to develop, to develop a format that translate our science in easy to understand language that could be initially understood by other natural scientists from other disciplines. However, after some times of simplification, we decided to produce um, a first comic that might be understandable for everyone who's a bit interested in science at least. So um, we will show you later that um, our comic has, um, the one from the example here, has even been ordered as hard copies by schools, for example. Um, so um, in this case, the audience can be um, inexperienced in science, 
but the reader should have some experience at least with the comic format because the design will be very typical, um, including we are using different numbers of images, we are using speech bubbles that um, might be inside or outside of specific images, um, the order of images might um, um, might be hard to follow from, from uh, time to time or uh, a bit confusing, but in the end it's very easy to learn and it really makes fun to read them. And um, before uh, Jan will go on with the meta methods in detail, I would just like to sum up um, the introduction um, that really at the beginning we wanted to develop a comic to raise awareness um, of our topic and to educate somehow but to be honest, at the beginning, our main personal motivation was our own interest in comic, in comics. Moreover, we were a bit, um, yeah, a bit bored by a press release that we had to write as an addendum for our our publication, and we wanted to do something really special. Um, so uh, Jan will go on now. Welcome everybody from my side as well. Um, Skanda already introduced you to uh, science communication, to comics, uh, to the scientific article we, uh, we base our comic on. And I'm now going uh, more in depth uh, to uh, the actual method that we applied and that we in, in part developed. Now, our mission uh, was, uh, as Skanda mentioned, uh, to turn a scientific paper into a comic. And uh, so we always have a uh, sign in our case, a scientific publication, a single scientific publication as the basis um, that we then turn into a comic. And this method was uh, developed uh, to uh, introduce scientific topics to a new audience, similar to what we're doing now, since we're holding a webinar in a series that is basically outside our main audience in, for example, the field of health. And uh, we want to provide a reference to a scientific article. So, in a nutshell, uh, the original method is aimed at natural scientists, uh, just as a classic uh, scientific paper. It's a reproducible step-by-step -step instruction on how to conceptualize and how to design a comic. And the comics are based on individual publications. At the same time, the presented framework is flexible, so uh, it can be adapted to convert publications from other disciplines into comics, for example, from the health sector or from the medical sciences. Um, and of course, it can also be uh, used to convert uh, publications such as uh, textbook knowledge uh, into comics. And uh, to really go into the different steps, uh, I will now go through uh, four methodological steps. The first one is to develop a conceptual framework, a foundation, and that basically um, is a first brainstorming that sets the, the theme of the future comic, um, it defines the main message or the uh, main messages um, and uh, provides a, a basis of how and in what format to translate the science into a comic. The second part will be to develop a scientifically relevant setting and uh, that is uh, the, the content of that will be how to build the background story. So, um, most of the research is, uh, is um, motivated by real world problems or uh, certain stakeholders are, uh, are affected by the research. Hello. And step three is uh, to develop characters that graphically describe the signs. Um, and that basically is uh, to convert text to graphics. So one is develop characters, maybe also based on stakeholders, but the second is also the pictorial language uh, that you develop. 
And uh, the fourth part will again be uh, presented by Skanda is uh, to develop a detailed storyline. This is used in our case because we use a professional artist and we also have to communicate with a professional artist, but also uh, it is used to fine tune the comic and do a detailed uh, page setup uh, where each panel is described in, in detail. So coming to the first part, the conceptual foundation, as you can see on this image, it's really a first brainstorming of uh, how the comic should be structured. And to describe that in a more theoretical way, it is a mental representation of the scientific work. Uh, we try to extract crit critical elements that shape the scientific work or the scientific paper and separate such critical elements from subsidiary information. So basically, we, you reduce your scientific work to a few major messages um, and then even have a nested approach where you condense these major me messages um, to summarize your science. Uh, this can often be done by summarizing your research in research highlights as, it, as is also uh, requested by several journals right now in terms of bullet points. And then the conceptual foundation unifies these bullet points. On the next page, you will see uh, the bullet points that we derived from the publication Skanda uh, presented earlier. So um, the publication was about population and economic pressures uh, required uh, the development of renewable energy sources. Plant derived bioenergy sources are promising, but compete with conventional crops. Uh, then, of course, we have the salt and plants, the halophytes that do not compete with conventional crops because they grow on saline soil, which conventional crops cannot handle. Um, and now if we come into the energy sector of how to turn that into bioenergy, halophytic microbes can speed up the degradation of halophyte uh, plants into bioenergy. And as a last point, the feasibility is assessed whether halophyte derived biofuel can act as a midterm renewable energy source. Now, if you're not from the field or even if you're from the field, this is still very complex. So, uh, we need to definitely readjust the focus of the original research paper, make it simpler, and also try to wake some emotions in the reader. And here is where you can all already think about uh, existing comic formats or existing comics and tap into fictional tropes. And uh, the way we condense this further is basically using uh, a very simple question, can halo fights fuel the world? And you can already see the theme of the comic, uh, you see the main message, um, and the theme of the comic is sort of, uh, if, 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 uh, as you see on the image, uh, a superhero theme, uh, just like uh, Superman or uh, Superwoman or Iron Man or whatever comics you can uh, you can imagine there, but you could also go into classical Greek mythology if you think about Odysseus or other characters. And this is just one theme that can be applied, but we now have the um, the major uh, topic. And in the following slides, we uh, thought about the concept of how do we describe the science, so we talk about the actual journey that uh, leads to answering this question. And uh, what you see here is the very first sketch uh, that Skander and I made during one of our meetings to design the comic. And here we decided we have four disciplines. Uh, we will have four pages, one per scientist. Uh, we are both members of an Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities. So we have a setting in a desert uh, as a reminiscence of, uh, of an Arab dry country. And in Germany, um, we thought about in including additional characters such as uh, Sultan in the background story. The Sultan character is both, uh, acts both as a funding agency 
or funding agent as well as the recipient uh, of the research so as a stakeholder and uh, Skanda already mentioned the the issues in science communications that uh, that brought us to this so we also developed the character of a science gin as a science communicator who communicates both between the disciplines as well as, as to the outside world and this will I will further describe this when it comes to the character development and then we end with a, a final presentation for the Sultan. So this is the very rough brainstorming conceptual foundation. And to come back to the paper, Skanda already uh, described uh, uh, differences between a science paper and a comic. What you see here is the, the paper. So on the left side, typical dominated by a lot of text, by some technical graphs, some tables and so on. And on the right side, you see the pages of the comic. In the centerpiece, you see four pages. These are basically the lab pages. This is basically the description of the science. Um, and these lab pages are consisted of, of several panels. And all the gray pages on top and on the bottom are uh, the background story that embeds the science. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, sort of the the end or the summary of the conceptual foundation and for the following methodological steps uh, what I would like to also always keep you in mind is to communicate content through sequential images so to really transform text into images um, and to reduce scientific details to short messages the next part on how to uh, turn your science into a comic is the scientifically relevant setting. So uh, here we talk about motivating the science or how the science is motivated. Uh, in this sense, real world problems can often be used in natural sciences. Um, in, in, in natural sciences, real world problems are energy demands, food security, water storage. But of course, thinking about the health sector or the medical sector, this can also be certain diseases. Uh, I, I've seen some comics that, for example, um, uh, describe uh, malaria or lymphatic filariasis um, and describe how they are, uh, how these uh, diseases are spread and how they're treated. Um, you identify common stakeholders that are, that are affected by the topic. We will come to that. Uh, that you can turn into potential characters. Here also in the medical sciences, of course, this can be the people that are affected by a certain disease. Uh, you identify socioeconomic conditions. Uh, in our case, this is now a, uh, a very, um, say, fossil fuel dominated country, uh, a desert country uh, that you could imagine to be in the Gulf area. In, uh, in several health comics that I saw, the socioeconomic or the local conditions were often set in West Africa, where a lot of diseases are, are spread and where people are very heavily affected by that, for example. And at the same time, um, you should uh, avoid technical terms by choosing an adequate setting, uh, for example, a natural ph phenomena or a laboratory setting that acts as a stereotype and that can basically transport the readers immediately in, uh, into a setting without using words. And now we will see how this uh, was translated in, in our sense. So what you see here on the left side is one of the uh, pages of our comic. We choose as a background story a semi-arid to arid region uh, that coincides often with saline soils. If you think about coastal strips that are, um, if you go into the science a little bit, uh, dominated by groundwater intrusion or by saltwater intrusion. So we wanted to have a desert environment. Uh, in reference to the Agia, to the Arab German Young Academy of Sciences, the desert environment uh, should have some kind of an, uh, of an Arab touch or Arabic touch. So we added some characters in there. Um, and the other point uh, that, we, uh, that we have here also expressed in the images is uh, renewable energy. 
So we are in a non-renewable energy mega city in a fossil fuel uh, dominated <coughs> setting. At the same time for this comic, we took great care that um, this is an anonymous country or region. Uh, for example, if you look at the skyline, there is no distinguishable skyline elements that links this to a real life city. Uh, all the persons in the comic, except for the four scientists, are non-real life persons. Um, and the only sort of recurrent or significant theme is you see is maybe uh, depicted from fairy tales from uh, Thousand and One Nights uh, um, tales. Here is a, an example from a recent comic we did uh, without describing the science too much. It's about urban forestry and how urban forestry can also shape uh, the, the water management in the city. And regarding the background story, what we did here is uh, we wanted an urban forest, so temperate city and some kind of history link. We took the city of Leipzig in Germany. The city name Leipzig is believed to originate from a Sorbian word, uh, which means linden or lime tree. Um, so we have this, uh, this reference to forests uh, from the city. And the second is, of course, that uh, my research institute is located in the city of Leipzig, so it could also, uh, it was a nice link to, uh, to the city. Uh, although in the original scientific uh, book chapter, there is no reference to the city of Leipzig, for example. Second is that uh, one of the stakeholders is the uh, municipality, so the city itself. So we actually included the deputy, ma deputy mayor responsible for environmental issues of the city of Leipzig. And he is represented in person in the comic. Of course, prior to, uh, to releasing the comic, uh, this was all um, coordinated with the city of Leipzig and with the deputy mayor to ensure that they agree to having them used in the comic. Now, already talking about characters such as the deputy uh, mayor, we come to the next section, which is characters and pictorial language. Characters must depict the major scientific elements and the major science work. The function of a character must be clearly defined. So uh, to depict certain details, uh, enhance the story, demystify technical terms, the use of colloquial language. Here we come back to sort of the character of the science communicator. And what we often use here are also stereotypic representations. Um, coming to stereotypic representations, the research direction may be represented by a character or the study authors themselves. Uh, the research direction you can also sort of depict uh, if you if you talk about uh, biochemical research or medical research, you can think about lab codes or certain stereotypic images that you relate to a hospital or to a, to a medical or a health uh, sector. Another point is that characters play an important role in the emotionalization of science communication. Uh, it is a well-known fact that humor sets free emotional energy and often leads to positive feedbacks. So uh, our solution in the Halo Fight comic was uh, that we always included some humor or some jokes in the dialogues between the science chin and the uh, sultan. And uh, as already mentioned before, most information should be covered in speech bubbles to focus on the characters. Um, some examples from the from the Halo fight uh, comic in terms of characters. So we have the Halo fight as a multifunctional plant. Halo fights can be used for food. They can be used for energy. Uh, they can be used to desalinize uh, uh, coastal strips. So uh, it's it's a Halo fight hero character uh, depicted by the sort of Superman cape, uh, by the multifunctional belt. Then we have the character of the science communicator. Uh, we described it as a, as a science gen being an ancient being that is able to translate all disciplinary language into colloquial language, into plain words. This character um, 
does not only help to translate between the disciplines, but also to the sort of wider audience. So whenever a scientific fact or a scientific finding is communicated, this takes place uh, by means of the science chin character. And then uh, the other character in in the comic is uh, the stakeholder in need for green energy. So we have the Sultan character who acts both as a funding agency as well as a recipient to the research results. Um, and in the in the meantime, uh, our science chin kind of became famous, uh, at least in the uh, in the academy. So uh, the Agia office uh, took up the science gin to um, communicate statements or, or, or findings from other projects in the newsletters. Uh, they, they made promotion articles, fridge magnets, t-shirts, postcards, and so on. And what you also see here is the science gin is being used to uh, promote the, uh, the memberships. Now, next to the characters, also pictorial language is uh, is very important. So to turn your um, your science into text, so stereotypes can help to replace text. Um, typical scientific instruments, field sampling, laboratory settings can transport the reader into a scientific discipline. Uh, but you can also think about known comic characters to uh, depict processes. Just as an example, there's many more, but if you think about Speedy Gonzales uh, for fast processes or snails or turtles for slow processes or whatever processes you, you have in your field, also think about known comic characters uh, that may help to transport that, uh, that information. Um, and to show you some examples uh, from the Halo Fight comic, we have uh, the centerpiece here in the in the slide is the sugar to energy conversion. Uh, there is a European comic series or a French comic series, Asterix and Obelix, uh, where Asterix always drinks magic potions to beat up Roman soldiers uh, mm -hmm. and thereby gets an energy boost. Um, or you have a uh, um, a Popeye uh, moment uh, where Popeye eats spinach and then uh, becomes much more powerful. His strength multiplies. And we use this to show the uh, sugar to energy conversion. So Skanda drinks, uh, as is typical in very, uh, very uh, many Arab or North African countries, a very sweet tea. And uh, that sugar in the tea basically gives him superpowers. So you can see he becomes this very muscular uh, element. The other one is laboratory settings uh, where you can use an Allen Meyer flask, a microscope, petri dishes, but also soil sampling equipment on the bottom or what is not shown here, but a greenhouse setting. And of course, use uh, uh, for energy demand, we use uh, large SUVs, cars, uh, we, uh, we use the image of mega cities in deserts, which of course require a lot of energy that, uh, and resources that the environment does naturally not uh, supply. Um, and next to the characters and pictorial language, you can also play with, uh, with settings. So in terms of the Halo fight uh, comic, uh, we have the science gin, uh, it's very colorful, so it's kind of cuddly, funny way to uh, uh, to show the whole comic story, uh, very light. Um, then uh, a follow-up uh, comic on a different topic uh, about urban forestry was with the character of Precipita, uh, which you see here, which is sort of a representation of a weather controlling character, and it's more drawn in a, in a dark tale. If you think about the uh, the original Batman comic series, for example, and our next comic, we're thinking to also play with different settings. So maybe have a romantic comedy or, or some other settings. Now we're working with a professional artist. 
So um, that gives us the opportunity to just tell Seta, uh, that's the name of the artist, to um, to uh, draw in a different style. So uh, for a recent project, I have an artist that I like very much from the 19th century called Karl Spitzweg. I, I sent him some, some, some examples from his work and uh, then he sort of came up with, uh, with the way uh, Karl Spitzweg is, is drawing. And uh, with that, I'm handing over to Skanda again, who will uh, now talk to you about uh, the fourth uh, section regarding um, the detailed storyline. So it's my turn now to um, go on with the very last talk of our approach. So um, after uh, having developed the conceptual foundation, uh, the background story and um, our characters, in the end, we have to develop a very detailed storyline. So in this detailed storyline, each single image um, should be completely designed, at least in our heads at the beginning. Um, it should be at the right uh, position in the, uh, on every page and um, um, in the full comic. And um, every uh, speech bubble and information must be at the correct position as well um, from this moment on. So um, since we are working together uh, with artists that realize our concepts, there is an issue of science communication again. So we need to explain everything in simplified form to the artist who is um, in a way already the first member of our future audience. And um, what we have to do uh, already is to structure the full story page wise. So uh, each page must contain enough information to justify its presence in the comic. And um, moreover, what we usually uh, try to do is um, we try to follow the rule that um, um, each or every single page should contain at least um, one message uh, that should be somehow transported to the audience. Um, we just would like to show you two um, examples here on this slide. Um, how we uh, transfer our information to the um to the art to the artist who draws the um comic so um for example um in on the uh um uh, in the upper row um there is a description of our very first imagination um of the title page um this uh description should be already precise um um so because we we already had um the look of the um of the title page in our in our head of course when we forwarded this to the artist however um here you can see there is written here image of a car um on the beach surrounded by halophytes one plant is morphed into a gas pump that fuels the car um at this moment we we did not have the superhero trope in our head already, but um, this was a developing process together with the uh, with the artist um, in this case. Um, in more detail, we need to describe complete page, pages that um, cover multiple figures. So um, to show you um, this process a little bit more in detail. Uh, I would like to switch to this um, slide. So um, here, um, the title of, of this uh, very um, small sketch is um, the salad scene. We have written here uh, for the artist that uh, the imagery should contain two characters that, that together um, they are eating food. Um, there should be the salty salad in front and they are talking and we already um, uh, provided the text as well. So here in the first speech bubble, which is on the right side, uh, on top, we, th we can see um, the character who's saying something like, ooh, even the leaves are salty. And um, this is an echo hydrologist um, 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 uh, scientist. And um, 
we uh, wanted to add uh, in this figure the information to the reader, uh, what we already said before, uh, earlier, that um, some of these plants, they are edible, although they are not competing uh, with the food industry, as uh, Jan already explained. And um, as the answer, the plant biologist names the plants using a very complicated scientific name. So he says something here like, uh, yeah, they prepared the salad with salicornia paramins. And then the question mark arises uh, above the head of the first character. And in the next image, we are not showing it here, but um, the next would be the science gin um, who materialized somehow and uh, who is explaining all the details uh, to the reader at this, um, at this, uh, um, in this moment. Um, and uh, the process with the artist, um, this is shown here on this slide. So um, the process is uh, highly iterative. Um, we are uh, um, we are getting feedback from the artist and um, also from some first test readers. Or we we are always showing um, uh, sketches of pages to colleagues and um, ask for opinions. And uh, usually we are improving these uh, images and the stories together with the artist roundwise in a way that we continuously try to simplify them all the time. So we are trying to simplify the content as well as the text. Um, for example, what we are uh, doing is we are using reoccurring elements as often as possible. Um, these can be the characters, for example, as indicated here, um, our science gin, but these uh, reoccurring el elements can also be single words that are going to repeat it on different pages um, because we have to use them often and we have to explain them earlier. For example, um, the word halophyte, we already explained it here in, in the webinar and we'll also explain it on one of the very first pages in the comic because this one is a very um, central part of, um, of our story shown here. Um, moreover, we replace and, and change specific items on single images to develop scenes or locations um, that are immediately recognized by the reader. So for example, here is a second page. Um, I hope that um, you all directly see that this is a construction worker and um, this is just a part of a two page comic we have uh, produced on our method, how to generate these comics. So um, this guy is somehow building or producing the comic. Um, and um, after several um, um, after several rounds of uh, of these sketches that were made by the artist, we then re, uh, receive a very first draft of a fully drawn image. And this one, in the best way, usually needs no or only little changes anymore. At least as long as we have made a good job and we have communicated everything to the artist in yeah in an appropriate way. And um, the very last thing we are usually doing is um, we are thinking about the title. So we, um, so uh, in the past we usually did this at the very end, and I really have to say this always makes a lot of fun because we're just sitting together, uh, brainstorming, and we try to define some rules. So what we wanted to to do is we. Um, want to um, generate a title that is somehow catchy and calls up some associations, but nevertheless, it should be a bit nerdy and scientific as well. So um, one of my favorites is this one from the comic we have presented here because um, it includes several homages to classical superhero comics or video games like, I don't know, The Rise of the Tomb Raider or The Incredible Hulk or um, things like this. But nevertheless, it's still very scientific um, and as a yeah, non-biological or biotechnological reader or an engineer, you um, will have to read the comic to understand what the salty salicornia power plant is. And um, yeah, if you're interested then in more details after having read the comic, then you might go on with the publication. Um, 
in the end, I would like to close uh, our lecture by giving you some information on the, out uh, on the outreach that we have generated. Um, for example, um, one thing we uh, realized very soon is that these, com these comics, they received much more uh, clicks in the, you know, let's say, scientific social media like ResearchGate or LinkedIn than the corresponding publications earlier. Um, moreover, we were very lucky to um, present um, our, uh, um, our concept in giving a talk at the most important science communication conference in Germany, which is usually not aimed at all to, uh, at natural scientists. Um, or um, um, we also uh, were very lucky to um, to be invited to write a blog article for the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Um, and for example, just yesterday, um, another science comic has been published by the University of Basel in Switzerland. And uh, they state that uh, uh, in their comic that they uh, have been somehow inspired by this blog and uh, by the method as well. Um, Moreover, um, we always try to, um, to publish our comics as open access and um, yeah, with, a, uh, with a, a, um, a Academy of Science in the back, we are even able to provide hard copies that can be ordered for free and we already uh, had to send um, several copies to schools and uh, to kids labs, for example. One of the comics has even been printed in the second edition now. Um, and for example, um, the, the other uh, example that Jan um, gave, um, the one with the um, urban forestry topic, uh, this one has been reprinted um, by the uh, Environmental Information Center of the city of Leipzig um, yeah, to provide uh, these comics to uh, interesting, uh, interested people. Um, and uh, one really highlight uh, we wanted to uh, to add here is um, that we were um, so lucky that we were able to receive um, funding to organize a launch event uh, with invited guests from different disciplines to present um, one of the comics, um, including um, there were some lectures living uh, giving and. Um, there, were, there was a cook who uh, prepared food made from salty plants, for example. And um, at this launch event, there were people from different YouTube channels and even um, some from Arab telev television stations uh, that have uh, produced reports and interviews during this event. And um, um, these are all a lot of examples of outreach that we never got before with our signs alone. Um, on this slide, I uh, will um, just um, show you at the end um, our outcomes so far. So we have um, published and summarized um, our method in a paper and additionally in form of a two-page comic. We have uh, published three comics so far. Um, one is based on a single research article, one is based on a single review article, and um, the last one is based on a single book chapter. And um, Jan uh, has just recently edited a book that will also contain graphical abstracts for each chapter in form of one-page comics. Myself, I um, also uh, have published a popular science book, but only in German um, last year, that also contains um, several comic illustrations. Um, on our last slide, uh, we would like to draw your attention uh, to the homepage of the artist who has drawn all these wonderful comics. Um, please visit his homepage. He's a really um, talented artist. And um, finally, we would like to thank the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany and the Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities for funding. And of course, um, we uh, would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Uh, we have a few questions, if you don't mind. Can you take a look at the um, panel, the chat panel on the right side? Um, let me know if you can't see these, but we have a couple of questions. One, let me read the first one. So that you mm. Oh, you go ahead. 
Uh, yes, uh, I can already uh, talk about some of the questions. So, uh, how do you find a good comic artist to work with? Uh, that's always a challenge because uh, the very professional comic artists, of course, are also relatively steep in terms of their hourly rates. Uh, what we started out is with uh, artists that uh, come from art colleges. So basically working with students, but I also know colleagues that uh, just uh, draw as a hobby. So they're very um, good at drawing. Um, regarding the question of how much time she, people should plan for when it comes to developing a comic. Uh, of course, we always have the, the science in the beginning and then basically Skanda and I had uh, two or three brainstorming weekends and some Skype calls uh, before approaching the comic artist. Our comic artist is very professional. So uh, he really needed very few time to uh, to draw the actual part, but uh, I think the most part is the the storyline, and uh, that really depends on on your team. In our case, it took maybe uh, three or four weekends uh, to design the story, and maybe Skanda has some additional. To the um, question about the duration of developing a comic. Um, not really. Um, maybe what uh, what I can answer is um, the question, how much does it cost to make comics and um, do you get extra funds for developing comics? So um, as already mentioned, we are very lucky with this Academy of Sciences in the back who um, is providing the funds and um, we can say, for example, just for um, for uh, preparing the comics, we were always um, applying for fundings, which are um, only to pay the comic artist, and these are of about five thousand dollars for uh, one comic of, let's say, twelve to fifty, uh, twelve to fourteen pages around. This is great. So, do you build the cost into your proposals, or do you? Is there a mechanism where you can apply for five thousand um, um, dollars to the academy? So, in case of the academy, we are allowed directly to apply exclusively just for this. So, um, unfortunately, of course, um, the um, the um, the funding acquisition for such small projects is always hard and um, Jan and I, we do not have an, um, we did not find so far another option to apply, at least I do not know. I don't know, maybe Jan has financed one of, uh, of his comments by another funding agency. Uh, yes, we have, uh, for funding, we have contacted, I've contacted my uh, research institute in terms of printing costs, for example. Uh, so our uh, public relations office has has funded some some printing costs. Uh, the other thing is that uh, nowadays uh, most of the proposals uh, that we uh, hand in to the EU or to the uh, BMBF, the German Ministry of uh, Education and Research, and many other funding organizations uh, also have an outreach part. And in these outreach parts, uh, uh, you could also include uh, comics or, or new formats uh, as, a, as a funding item. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Okay, thank you. Thank you both so much again. Um, I think this was um, really, really good food for thought. Um, I certainly am not aware of any funding resource, but we will look into this. Um, thank you again, and um, thank you, the audience, for staying a little bit over time. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.